I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thanks, Tom. Let me just pull my slides up real fast. Awesome. All right, so like Tom said, my name is Rebecca Baskins and I am the Executive Director for California Advanced Biofuels Alliance. We are the state's trade association for renewable diesel and biodiesel, and we represent the whole supply chain. So from the, the used cooking oil collectors all the way to the producers and everyone in between. So before I jump into the LCFS, I wanted to touch briefly on about what biodiesel and renewable diesel are. So biodiesel is made through a chemical process in which resources like recycled or used cooking oil or UCO, soybean oil and animal fats are converted into biodiesel. Renewable diesel is made from those same feedstocks or renewable resources, but through a different production process and it results in a chemically identical fuel to petroleum diesel, yet it's renewable. So both uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel are drop-in fuel replacements for petroleum diesel meaning uh, there's no need for engine turnover and they are available today for, uh, for use in, in those diesel trucks. So what exactly is the low carbon fuel standard or the LCFS? So the LCFS is designed to encourage the use and production of cleaner low carbon fuels in the state. Uh, some major goals of the program are to reduce GHGs, improve air quality, reduce our dependency on petroleum and diversify the fuel pool and promote the uh, production of alternative fuels, among other things like getting us closer to some of our other climate goals in the state. The LCFS standards are expressed in terms of carbon intensity or CI, which you'll hear quite a bit today, um, of gasoline, diesel, and their respective substitutes like biodiesel and renewable diesel. So CI is defined as a life cycle GHG emission of fuel per unit of transportation energy delivered I'll go into further of exactly how that's determined, but uh, the lower the CI score, the higher amount of carbon credits you're going to receive, thus uh, making it more valuable. Uh, fuels that have CI lower than the target established or the benchmark that CARB, and CARB is the agency that oversees the low carbon fuel standard. Sorry, missed that earlier. Um, they generate LCFS credits and those with CIs higher than that benchmark, they generate deficits. So a fuel producer at the end of each year that creates deficits, they must have enough credits to offset those deficits. And if they don't, then they're, they're not in compliance. And those uh, deficit holders are gonna be those oil producers or petroleum producers. So California goal is to reduce transportation emissions by 20% uh, in 2030. And that's because of all the GHGs emitted in the state, about 50% of those are from the transportation sector. 40, about 40% uh, of those are from direct emissions and then 10% or roughly 10 are from the, um, the refining of the fuels. So that's creating that 50% that mark. Uh, the beauty of the LCFS is that the market, uh, it lets the market determine which mix of fuels are used to reach the target. So they gave us that 20% reduction target, but they're not telling us exactly what fuels need, it, need to be used. So it's a fuel neutral and market-based program. This slide here is an example of uh, how a fuel life cycle is determined for uh, this example is for UCO biodiesel. It's a very rigorous process. And then this process will help determine or will determine the CI score of the fuel. So uh, we use this term called well to wheel. So it means it, the life cycle will start at the collection of the UCO and it will go all the way up to the, uh, the emissions that are um, are measured from the tailpipe of the, the trucks that are using the fuel. So for example, right here, the, um, the life cycle starts with the UCO collection, then it goes into the rendering of the, of the UCO, which makes the, the UCO usable to make into a biodiesel, but then it's transported to a bio, biodiesel production facility, then transported and blended either with renewable diesel or petroleum diesel brought to the pump put in your truck and then those emissions from the tailpipe are measured as well. So it's that full life cycle. Um, most of the biodiesel and renewable diesel made in the state are from, are used, or the feedstocks are UCO and animal tallow. So that let periwinkle blue and then that green. Um, and because they're usually collected pretty close to the, the production facility, our CI scores of the, the biodiesel and renewable diesel in the state are very low. 
So how does uh, the low carbon fuel standard work? So all fuel providers must register. So that's your, your gasoline, your diesel, your aviation fuel, and those deficit holders or petroleum refiners, they must know their status of compliance at all time. Each credit equals one metric ton of carbon reduction, um, yet those credit generators, they'll report their volumes quarterly and receive those credits quarterly. And they can either decide if they wanna hold on to those credits or they can sell them immediately upon issuance by CARB. So at the end of each year, those deficit holders, they're gonna sum up all their deficits and credits. If their credits are greater than or equal to the deficits, they're in compliance, they're good to go. But if those credits are less than their deficits, then they're not in compliance. And then um, if they're not in compliance, they need to purchase credits in Q1 of the following year to offset those deficits. So all these transactions are reported through an online platform, but those transactions are business to business. The CARB um, doesn't receive any fees or revenues from the credits generate, uh, or fuel transactions. This slide here just shows you the carbon intensity benchmarks of gasoline and diesel. As you can see in 2019, it was 93.23 for gasoline, 94.17 for diesel. And then if you were to look at 2021, it's 90.74 to 91.66 respe respectively. And as you can see, um, these, these CI benchmarks, they lower each year, thus getting us closer to that 20% reduction goal. Uh, this uh, graph or calculator here just gives you an example of how um, credit values are generated. So say you have a biomass based diesel with this 30 CI score, you would go to that left hand column 30 and then uh, let's just use 196 for example, that would generate nearly a, a dollar and 44 cents credit per gallon of that fuel and that's at that 196 credit price. Uh, biomass based diesel has the lowest CI of all liquid fuels. Uh, the lower end of biomass diesel CI scores are roughly in that 8 to 16 range, and then the averages are typically 26 to 33. Uh, just to give you an example, this is on par with electricity. The low end CI scores for electricity are about 17, and then the average is roughly 24. This graph here shows you how biomass based diesel pars in the, um, the low carbon fuel standard. As you can see, volumes don't necessarily equal the amount of credits. Um, for example, ethanol, there's a lot of ethanol in the program, but they don't generate as many credits as say biodiesel and renewable diesel, and that's because of their CI score. Um, if you look at the credit graph right there on the right, you can see in 2018 and 2019, about 45% of the credits generated in the program were from the low carbon, uh, excuse me, we're from biodiesel and renewable diesel. Um, this graph here just shows you the value of biomass-based diesel credits that have been generated since um, 2013. It's about 6.7 million credits valued at uh, $1.3 billion. So that's at that 192 credit mark, which is roughly $1.50 gallon uh, value from credits. Uh, because the credits are so valuable, it's helping stimulate investment into uh, the production of these low carbon fuels. So, which this shows, uh, this graph shows you right here, um, because those, those credits are so valuable, there, there's been a tremendous growth of the industry um, in the state, nearly 6,000% since the inception of the program. Uh, that's nearly 4 billion gallons of petroleum diesel displaced since 2011. And now biomass-based diesel is nearly a quarter or 22% of the diesel pool in the state. Uh, just to give you a big picture, the um, California diesel market is roughly about 4 billion, a little less than 4 billion gallons uh, of fuel consumed each year. Last year, uh, biodiesel was consumed um, at 267 million gallons and then uh, renewable diesel was 589 million gallons. So roughly 850 million gallons of biomass-based diesel uh, consumed last year. Overall, um, the low carbon fuel standard is a huge success. Uh, it has eight, over 8 million credits in the bank, which is valued at $1.6 billion. But the big, uh, the big kicker here is it's displaced 18 billion gasoline gallon equivalents since the inception. Uh, one of the main goals of the program is to promote alternative fuels, which it has, and which is why you've seen such a great growth of the biomass-based diesel industry, um, and that's getting California closer to our climate goals. Uh, California has led the way on, in this program and many other states um, and countries have actually uh, looked to California 
um, to model similar programs in their own states. But overall, it's a great it's a great program. It helps promote alternative fuels, gets us closer to our goals, um, and it's very valuable to our state. So, with that, I will uh, kick it over to the next the next presenter. But thanks so much for having me, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, if we could hold the questions till till the end, we'd appreciate it. But uh, thank you, Rebecca and Kava, for everything you're doing for our industry out in California. Like you said, California is a leader in climate policy, carbon uh, decarbonization policy. Now, Oregon and just recently the state of Washington passed the uh, low carbon fuel standards and looks, I think there's some other states that are looking to do the same here shortly. So uh, you guys have been a real tra trailblazer and thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Floyd Vergara. Floyd is the state governmental affairs director for the National Biodiesel Board. He's located there uh, in Sacramento along with Rebecca. Um, uh, before that, uh, Floyd was at the California Resources Board and what, what was the prime author of the low carbon fuel standard uh, uh, that we're talking about. So we we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Floyd join us at the National Biodiesel Board. So as Rebecca was saying, biodiesel and renewable diesel can play uh, an important role in reducing carbon reductions. It also has significant health benefits and that's what's uh, uh, but uh, we needed to better quantify those benefits. And that would, that's what Floyd would like to talk about now in the, the Trinity study and how we did that. So Floyd. Thanks, Tom. Uh, greetings from uh, Sacramento. Um, let me uh, share my screen here. Everybody see this? Yes. Uh, it, it, yeah, hold on. Looks like I didn't start at the at the beginning. <clears throat> Sorry. Come on. There you go. All right. Everybody see this? Yes. Okay, so um uh, great to be here um, talking about the uh, landmark uh, Trinity, Trinity study. So as Tom mentioned, um, I was 32 years at the, at the Air Resources Board. Um, I um, wrote the language for the low carbon fuel standard, standard uh, was part of the original design team there, but I also oversaw our conventional gasoline and diesel fuels program our waste and energy programs, as well as uh, leading the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee for two years. So the reason I mentioned that is the Trinity study reflects um, sort of all of those experiences and, and represents kind of the conjunction of all of those uh, learnings and the knowledge that uh, biodiesel uh, has very significant um, uh, environmental and public health benefits. Uh, we haven't been able to quantify those uh, to uh, anything more meaningful than percent reduction of uh, particulate matter uh, until this point. And that's why the Trinity study is uh, groundbreaking, uh, not only for that, but because it provides the resolution uh, of those benefits at the neighborhood level, as, as we'll talk about in a minute. So um, here's what we'll cover. Um, and I think as Rebecca mentioned, uh, you know, th these are drop-in fuels, biodiesel and renewable diesel. I'm going to focus on biodiesel since that's what the study looked at. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I believe most of you are aware of the greenhouse gas uh, benefits uh, up to 89%, 74% um, uh, on average. But I think what doesn't get uh, enough airplay, and that's the value and the, the beauty of this study is that it really highlights the significant air quality and um, public health benefits uh, from the use of biodiesel. And this is directly in response to its uh, substantial ability to reduce uh, particulate matter, especially the fine uh, PM 2.5, as well as uh, carbon monoxide, um, uh, toxic uh, uh, organics and, and other noxious uh, air pollutants. Um, I'm going to uh, do a little spoiler alert here uh, and jump to the, um, uh, the highlights of the uh, results itself. Uh, as I mentioned, the scientific literature is replete with, uh, and we've known for many years that biodiesel can significantly reduce um, particulate matter, especially the 
the fine PM 2.5 that can really get deep into your lungs and cause a lot of damage, uh, as well as toxics. But as I mentioned, the ability to um, quantify that into more meaningful metrics uh, has been limited until this point. And that's why this um, Trinity, Trinity study is very valuable. So jumping ahead to the, um, the uh, main takeaways of the, the study, um, we looked at, the study looked at 13 different sites across the country and found that switching from petroleum diesel to 100% biodiesel would prevent uh, on an annual basis, 340 premature deaths, 46,000 uh, fewer sick days, and uh, $3 billion per year in avoided health costs. Uh, it also would um, reduce uh, cancer risk by 45% uh, in, in transportation uses and would reduce over 200,000 um, asthma attacks each year. And then when you use uh, B100 as a bioheat fuel uh, in heating oil, hello? Uh, yeah, as you use bioheat uh, fuel in heating oil, um, you would uh, reduce cancer risk by 86% and, re um, and reduce uh, uh, lung problems by 17,000 uh, each year. Those lung problems would manifest mainly in, in cases, in asthma uh, cases. And, uh, you know, another highlight of the study is that these are just 13 sites. So literally the tip of the iceberg. I won't go too much into this. Uh, Rebecca covered this really well, but you know, biodiesel is basically your poster child for a circular economy. It could be made from a number of different waste and, and uh, byproduct uh, oil, oil streams. Okay, and uh, Rebecca showed this, uh, an earlier version of this. I uh, updated it to include last year's data. And basically the upshot here is that, um, you know, California, the California market recognizes the environmental benefits uh, of biodiesel and renewable diesel, and that's reflected in the low carbon fuel standard. Um, basically, since 2015, uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel have carried the lion's share of carbon reductions in the LCFS program in California, um, uh, about 45, 44, 45 percent over the last three years, and 42 uh, percent of those carbon reductions since 2011. Um, one of the important aspects of this is because biodiesel and renewable diesel are drop-in fuels, as Rebecca mentioned, those carbon reductions that you achieve by using it are immediate. And that's important from a time value of carbon, meaning that uh, reducing 100 tons of carbon now is a lot more impactful as far as the climate is concerned uh, than reducing a that same 100 tons of carbon in 20, 30 years. A little more flavor on the um, on the growth of the volume of biomass-based diesel, as Rebecca mentioned, has been growing steadily. Um, last year, of course, was uh, uh, affected by COVID, but as you can see, there's still growth there. Um, and now, uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel collectively um, represent nearly a quarter of each gallon of diesel fuel consumed in California. Um, so why is this important? Well, as I mentioned, um, you know, biodiesel uh, has a very uh, strong ability to reduce uh, uh, particulate matter, and particulate matter is very important, uh, especially for um, you know what are called in environmental justice or disadvantaged, excuse me, disadvantaged communities uh, in California. So here's a graph that um, CARB put out uh, a couple of years ago, and basically what it shows is that there's been because of the um, variety of different uh, diesel um, uh, diesel exhaust uh, reduction programs uh, put into place. There's been a significant reduction in uh, PM in California, but as this graph shows, there's been a disparity in where those PM reductions have occurred. Um, so as you can see here, uh, both EJ communities and non-EJ communities have enjoyed reductions, uh, significant reductions in PM. Um, but as you can see here, EJ communities started out at an elevated uh, gap relative to the non-EJ communities, and they continue to have that gap. So it's important uh, from an environmental and public health standpoint to continue to get those reductions. Uh, and those reductions are happening now, and they can continue to happen uh, at a greater rate with expanded use of biodiesel and renewable diesel. 
The other important aspect of this is time. And of course the states and especially California is pursuing uh, a, a aggressive electrification program, um, which they should do. I mean, that, you know, that's what their uh, modeling has shown would be necessary. Uh, and I guess the main point here is the amount of time and the public and private investments it would take uh, to achieve the, that deep electrification and deep decarbonization. So here's a graph from CARB uh, that was produced during the rulemaking for the advanced clean trucks. Um, I would point your attention to the, um, this portion of the graph, which represents the zero emission vehicles or the electric heavy duty trucks that are in the class seven and eight, um, which are the hardest to decarbonize and hardest to electrify sector of the heavy duty uh, market, heavy duty vehicle market. And as you can see here, um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you're not doing the calculation in your head, but I've done it. And this, um, this percentage represents uh, the, the penetration into the total class seven and eight market. And by 2040, California, California's own numbers show that um, that penetration would be about 6.6%. So less than 10% of the uh, class seven and eight, the biggest uh, and the, the biggest trucks and the biggest source of GHGs in the heavy duty market um, would still be, so 90% of that market would still be uh, non-electric in 20 years. So you could see that uh, even the aggressive trajectory that CARB has uh, put itself on will not get, you know, make a meaningful dent into that market for many, many years. And so the question is um, what should and what can the states do um, while they are pursuing deep electrification to continue to get both GHG reductions and um, those criteria pollutants and uh, public health impactful reductions that are needed. And that brings up the uh, Trinity uh, study. So let me go a little bit into the background here. So uh, we call it the Trinity study because it was conducted by Trinity Consultants, which is a worldwide multinational consulting firm, uh, highly respected. The, the main reason we picked them was because of that, um, the respect that they enjoy in that uh, space, but also because of the over four decades of expertise they have in particular fields that we were looking for that are important for providing the resolution that we needed um, to do this study. And that's expertise in uh, four decades of expertise in air dispersion modeling and health risk assessments, specifically using those tools that both CARB and US EPA uses when they are assessing regulatory strategies. So these are the same tools that the, the two major regulatory agencies use. And the question that was posed in the study was, was pretty simple, um, but of course implementation is uh, was very resource intensive and uh, involved a lot of uh, computer modeling and data gathering and inventories and all that. But the question really was, if you took a site that used a lot of petroleum diesel and you converted that diesel to 100% biodiesel, what would the benefits to a person living nearby um, be? Um, and that's a, that's a simple question, but it's been difficult to answer uh, until now, uh, mainly because it's, it's such a complicated and resource intensive um, um, project to do. Uh, and that is very meaningful to the folks that live in environmental justice communities because um, for the most part, they tend to be uh, living in communities that are located uh, at or very near these uh, facilities that use a lot of diesel. So um, that's the question that was posed. And like I said earlier, historically, um, the benefits of uh, fuels have been expressed in terms of percent reduction, percent reduction in PM, percent reduction in CO and so forth. Um, but it, in our minds, we needed to go beyond that and take it to the next level, which is converting that through air dispersion modeling and health risk assessments into metrics that are much more meaningful to the average person living in these communities. And by meaningful metrics, I mean, cancers uh, reduced, um, premature deaths avoided, asthma attacks avoided, uh, loss of work days reduced and so forth. And then uh, uh, quantifying those benefits into costs, avoided costs um, using uh, the, um, the methodologies that EPA uses um, 
for, for doing that sort of uh, econometric analysis. So uh, the study, uh, as I mentioned, uh, looked at 13 different sites. Uh, we focused on sites on the West Coast and in Colorado, uh, looking at transportation sources there. So uh, in California, we looked at the Port of LA Long Beach, um, the uh, West Oakland, another uh, port uh, uh, city, South Fresno representing agricultural operations, and then South San Bernardino uh, representing a very large uh, uh, logistics facility, many, many uh, warehouses in that area. Uh, Oregon, uh, uh, we looked at Portland, which is a high ur urban traffic uh, region uh, in Washington, Port of Seattle and Everett. Uh, and in uh, Denver, uh, Colorado, we looked at uh, high urban traffic. And then on the East Coast, we looked at uh, heating oil since that's a growing uh, interest there. Uh, for con controlling and reducing those emissions. So in New York, we looked at um, a housing development in the Bronx and the surrounding uh, areas, and then Albany uh, and Boston, Massachusetts, uh, New Haven and uh, Providence, uh, Rhode, Island, Rhode Island. Um, I won't go too much into this. Uh, you know, the historical sort of analysis in this space uh, typically use what we call a top-down analysis. So basically, taking the emissions that are known at a very broad, high level, wide geographical region, and then trying to infer um, the impacts to a person um, using a variety of assumptions and techniques. Uh, it's not very robust with respect to the person on the ground. It's a very average sort of analysis, uh, statewide average. Uh, so what we wanted to do with this, um, was distinguish this uh, study from previous studies by doing a, a resource intensive bottom up analysis where you're actually starting at the ground level, looking at the emission sources at the ground and then seeing how the um, wind patterns and meteor meteorological conditions and uh, buildings uh, you know, affect the dispersion of the air pollutants and then how that reaches people on the ground and how that affects them using uh, standardized health risk assessment. So the um, takeaway here is that the bottom-up uh, approach, which is used in the Trinity study, uh, provides you with the ability to look at what's happening at the neighborhood or census tract level. Okay, so um, I showed you the, uh, the bottom line uh, numbers. Here are the um, uh, graphical representations that were uh, the result of the uh, computer modeling that was done using the most uh, uh, recent available data from uh, CARB and EPA. Um, so we'll start off with West Oakland, as I mentioned, as a port. So the red areas here represent the, um, so the left uh, side of the graph, so you'll see a number of these the left side of the graph uh, represents the before and the right side uh, after switching to B100. The red, uh, reddish uh, areas represent the most elevated uh, cancer risk levels. And then of course the yellows and greens represent the reduced. And as you can see here for this site uh, looked at in West Oakland, uh, you can see a very elevated uh, risk level there um, due to the high level uh, use of petroleum diesel. And then that would be projected to reduce substantially cancer risk um, by 45%. Again, this is a transportation analysis. And as you can see uh, here, the number of premature deaths and uh, uh, asthma cases reduced and so forth, and then quantified uh, into, the, um, into the dollar amounts here. And as you can see here, that's well over, that's, that's nearly, uh, that's well over $170 million per year of avoided health costs. Looking at the agricultural operation site in South Fresno, a similar result here, you get a very high uh, elevated risk uh, that would be reduced substantially by switching over to B100. Um, it's a more sparsely populated area, so you don't get as high um, a set of numbers, but they are still substantial. And again, uh, these are per year uh, basis and these are the cancer risks reduced. Looking at uh, Denver, Colorado, again, this is a, a heavy traffic urban areas. Again, very similar um, before and after uh, picture here. 
this is a very densely uh, populated region. And so the, um, the results from this analysis would indicate a much higher, um, much higher set of benefits than the, um, than the previous slide. Here we looked at uh, the Bronx, New York, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, heating oil analysis. Uh, we did the analysis uh, uh, focused on this region here, which is the Sotomayor housing complex in the Bronx, and then did the uh, air dispersion modeling um, around a, I think this is a six or seven mile diameter region. As you can see here, switching to B100 would uh, substantially reduce those, those cancer risks and provide um, diesel PM reductions that would then in turn reduce uh, a number of uh, adverse health outcomes. Uh, Albany, New York, very similar result, a little bit lower since uh, not as many people and they're not as densely um, packed. And then uh, finally, New Haven, Connecticut here, again, similar result. Um, look, you know, you have uh, several elevated cancer risk uh, areas there that would be reduced. Um, you know, this is not quite as dense uh, as the, the Bronx. And so um, these uh, numbers are commensurate with that, but still these are uh, substantial reductions and improvement or substantial improvements in local public health. So bringing us back to the, um, the summary of the results, uh, as you can see here, these are 13 different sites, just 13. And of course, there are probably hundreds of similar sites across the country. And so if you take these uh, results and extrapolate them and apply them to uh, similar sites across the country, you can imagine that the benefits are gonna be substantially higher. Um, and again, uh, a takeaway here is that biodiesel is a drop in fuel. So if you were to do this switch over tomorrow, these, these sort of public health benefits would accrue immediately. And that's on top of the greenhouse gas um, benefits that also accrue immediately. So uh, in conclusion, uh, substantial public health benefits, of course, uh, as we've known in the scientific literature, and now we can show uh, in both graphical and uh, quantified uh, benefits, and these are largely driven by um, PM reductions, uh, PM 2.5 reductions, which can uh, go from 45 to 86 percent, as you saw. Uh, and the important thing here is that it now gives you that quantification at the neighborhood level, and that's important for, especially for disadvantaged and EJ communities. In my work at CARB, that I often heard, um, you know, what do I do? You know, I, I hear from single moms or you know, uh, working families. What do I do today? What do I do tomorrow in terms of, you know, informing myself? Uh, what do I do with my kid? Do I take him to school, my asthmatic kid? Do I keep him out of the, the yard because it's gonna be a high uh, smog day? This is sort of information that could really inform those, those important day-to-day -day decisions. Um, these benefits would accrue disproportionately for those communities that are around these high diesel use activities. Um, and the results from the Trinity uh, study, they were, the, the study was designed so it's scalable to other uh, similar sites in other regions, and it could also be scalable to other blends of biodiesel. I mean, we did it at B100, but of course it could be scaled to other blend levels of, of biodiesel. Um, the study uh, provides both a method for screening additional uh, sites, and it also provides the framework for doing the detailed analysis of those sites um, that have gone through the screening analysis. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we looked at just 13 sites and we already got significant uh, benefits for those sites. So it's the tip of the iceberg. And once again, can't emphasize it enough, biodiesel is a drop in fuel. And so those benefits would accrue immediately upon use, both from a GHG and from an air quality standpoint. And that's it, I hope I stayed within my time. Uh, but uh, pass it back to Tom and we'll take questions afterwards. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Floyd. Uh, great presentation. And uh, it shows that uh, uh, biodiesel um, has significant carbon reduction benefits and uh, health uh, uh, benefits. So uh, as the federal policies that support biodiesel uh, uh, market development, uh, we can show uh, direct benefits back to uh, back to the states and back to the individual uh, communities. So thanks, Floyd. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, 
we've had Rebecca and uh, Floyd on the more on the association side. Now we're going to hear from the private industry. Uh, Harry Simpson with Crimson Renewable Energy, and uh, he's going to talk about how important uh, having uh, a stable uh, and predictable energy policy to support fuels like biodiesel is to his business. So he's the largest, they have the largest biodiesel producer in, in the state located in Bakersfield. Uh, they just acquired a, another biodiesel company in the Northwest, uh, Sequential. So uh, uh, they've expanded in there and they're one of the largest, some of the largest uh, biodiesel uh, distributor on the West Coast. So um, Harry, uh, can you take it away from here? You guys hear me? Yeah, thank you, Harry. Hello? Okay, let me share my screen. You guys see that? Yes. All right. Looks good. Let me, oops, sorry. Back it up. Um, thanks, Tom, for that nice introduction. Uh, we actually acquired Sequential in 2018, although uh, it does in some ways feel like yesterday. In other ways, uh, it feels like they've always been a part of us. Um, I'll give you a quick intro. Uh, these are actually some pictures of our plant in Bakersfield. Uh, it's a pretty good sized facility. Um, we're the largest producers, Tom mentioned, in Oregon. Uh, we're also the only real industrial commercial scale biodiesel producer since we acquired Sequential. Uh, we expanded that uh, to now produce 12 million gallons a year. Uh, our customers, um, we heard a lot about biodiesel today and, and the health effects, all that great work that Trinity did. Um, the reality is, you know, how does biodiesel get to market? We sell it to major oil companies who are blending biodiesel uh, at a fuel terminal uh, or even at the refinery if they're, they're selling uh via a rack at the refinery. Uh, but the biggest buyers tend to be your national truck stop chains and independent uh, truck stop operators. Uh, you would be very hard pressed to drive up and down California and Oregon, uh, for example, and, and really find um, regular diesel at the pump at those truck stops. It's almost all B20 now. Um, and then fuel wholesalers who deliver biodiesel uh, at various blend levels to truck fleets, whether it's a FedEx or a Safeway. Um, a lot of the, uh, in the Central Valley here in California, um, a lot of folks are using it also in the ag sector. Um, our plant, as I said, is located in Salem for sequential and Bakersfield, California. Uh, that was our original plant. We just completed an expansion of basically uh, built a new plant, and now we our capacity company wide is 48 million gallons. Um, we tend to make our biodiesel mostly from used cooking oil. Uh, we do, uh, on occasion, run some other raw materials as well, such as trap grease or distiller's corn oil and animal fats. Uh, these are all inedible oils that are, uh, in the case of animal fats, for example, coming from a slaughterhouse or our new plant can run uh, it sounds kind of gross, but uh, there's a, a rendering facility in California that only processes uh, animals that that die, not via like slaughtering for meat. But for example, California, most people don't know, produces about 25% of the country's milk. And most of those dairies are between Fresno and Bakersfield. Um, so when cows, uh, dairy cows die, they don't get turned into steaks. They, they have to get processed. Um, and we can run that kind of material, for example, to make biodiesel. Um, that's a picture of our new plant in Bakersfield. Uh, so we've been growing uh, pretty consistently. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because it's really the policy environment that makes that possible. Um, as I was saying, the, the new plant can run uh, some things that we can't run today that very few biodiesel plants uh, in the United States can run in terms of things like trap grease or dead stock animal fats. Um, one thing that Tom didn't mention is we're also a very large collector of used cooking oil. Uh, we collect used cooking oil from approximately 25,000 locations from Seattle down to you know, southern LA, essentially San Bernardino, Riverside, for example. Um, and that biodiesel gets collected. 
uh, we we kind of talk about collect, refine, refuel. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is have sort of a full life cycle where we're collecting the used material, uh, this used cooking oil from all kinds of customers. I mean, it could be the Google uh, campus over in uh, Palo Alto, or, or I guess it's somewhere in Silicon Valley. Uh, corporate campuses, fast food chains, stadiums, hotels, mom and pop restaurants. Uh, really runs the whole gamut. And we then bring it to a collection depot. Um, and some of our collection depots are also processing centers. The used cooking oil has to get cleaned up, um, basically, before it can be used as a raw material for biofuel production. And then we take it to our biodiesel plants. Um, and then typically, all of the fuel that we make is generally consumed within 100 miles of our plant. Um, so it's a, kind of a uh, much more localized regional uh, model for fuel production and, and the economic activity that it generates you know, keeps those dollars uh, really recycling within the local economy. So if we think about uh, you know, our business in California from collecting used cooking oil, producing it into biofuel and in Bakersfield, last couple of years, we spent about $100 million in California. Um, we don't collect enough to uh, run our facility entirely on our own collection. Uh, so we're also one of the largest buyers of used cooking oil uh, on the West Coast. And most of that used cooking oil we buy then comes from other collectors up and down um, the West Coast, and even from places like Las Vegas, relatively close by. Um, and then we just spent another $45 million on that new plant that you see there. Um, and that was all built by local contractors. So that was, a, I think at one point, we had about 120 people on site working on this. It was a pretty significant challenge during COVID. Um, at any rate, as I said, you know, it's policies that kind of make it happen. And, and our policies, I think, as they've evolved, policymakers look at the things I have up here, environmental, um, energy security. If we look at the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard, um, the act that was actually uh, enacted in 2007 was the Energy Independence and Security Act. So that program ostensibly was based on improving energy security and incentivizing a local homegrown uh, biodiesel industry and ethanol industry as well uh, so that we could have uh, renewable fuels produced in America, consumed in America. The environmental benefits, Floyd obviously hit on all those. Uh, I'm not going to repeat them, but uh, the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard is also the only program uh, that ostensibly explicitly states uh, talks about reduction in GHG and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the economic benefit, I mean, just using, I think, our business as an example, uh, you know, these businesses, these these plants uh, create a local ecosystem in terms of, of economic activity. Um, and biofuels have both on the corn ethanol side uh, and biodiesel, biomass-based diesel, you know, they've become pretty significant uh, foundational elements to our agricultural economy. Um, it's done a lot to lift. Uh, some of you probably aren't old enough, but you know, I remember being in college and there was this thing called farm aid. It was pretty bad for the farmers in the late 70s and 80s uh, to the point where rock stars and musicians you know, put on a concert and donated the proceeds to farmers. Um, today, that's not necessary. Um, but these policy mechanisms, as I said, you know, drive our business and frankly, our whole industry. There wouldn't be a biofuels industry uh, in this country if not for these policies. And you know, how these policies will evolve in the future will certainly drive whether a company like mine can continue to prosper and, and continue to invest. I mean, we started in 2000. 12 was our first full year of production. We produced 3 million gallons, maybe 3.2. Uh, and now we have a capacity of 48 million. So as we've uh, improved our operations, you know, we consistently reinvest in our business, and that helps our communities. I talked a bit about the federal renewable fuel standard. Uh, on the federal side, another big part that's driving the industry 
is the federal blenders tax credit. So that's a tax credit where biodiesel gets blended with petroleum diesel, and it's a tax credit that, in effect, gets shared between the that up and down the value chain. When I talk about a value chain, I'm talking about taking the raw material, turning it into fuel, and then the fuel gets consumed. Um, it doesn't sit in a producer's pocket. It doesn't sit in any one particular part of that value chain. It, it gets spread throughout, and it helps incentivize the industry and incentivize blending. At the state level, you've heard about the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Oregon has the Clean Fuels Program, which is a uh, basically a carbon copy of the LCFS. Other states will either have tax incentives or producer incentives. Uh, some states also have a, a mandate where you have to have a certain minimum percentage of biodiesel and all the diesel fuel sold. So there's a couple listed there. Um, California was the first with the LCFS. And Rebecca talked a bit about that. Um, that's really catalyzed. If not, if California hadn't passed that, uh, obviously, I don't. I, I just don't think we'd see what we see today, where Oregon uh, copied that and, and actually went even a little further, where it says your 10% reduction in 25, but they've actually now since uh, put into the statute a 25% reduction requirement by 2035, and, and they wanted to one up California, which currently is at 20% by 2030. Uh, the state of Washington just passed an LCFS this year. It's going to basically copy the California program and start next year. A um, bunch of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states have talked about putting in a regional LCFS. New York and Mexico each had that on the table in their legislative calendar this year. Uh, British Columbia, Canada. So I, I think, uh, you know, states are, are deciding or reaching the conclusion that you know, if the federal government isn't going to do something about carbon reduction, um, particularly in the transportation sector, because it's such a big part of carbon reductions, depending on whose data you want to utilize, 38, 40, 41% of all GHG is coming from transportation. Um, and that's catalyzed the growth in, in California. Uh, this kind of shows you as well as nationally. You know, from 2010, we had uh, an industry in its infancy almost non-existent in California. Um, and if we go fast forward to today, uh, almost 3 billion gallons of uh, biomass-based diesel is being consumed in the United States and in California. Uh, it was about 860 million last year. Um, <clears throat> California is really, because of the LCFS, sort of uh, growing to the point where it punches way above its weight. It's about 25% of of all the biomass-based diesel fuels consumed in the United States are consumed in California. And it's been growing faster because of that LCFS program. Um, I think one of the other things too is, you know, biomass-based diesel, biodiesel, they're drop-in fuels. You don't have to modify the engine. You don't need a new engine. You don't need to change the fueling infrastructure. You can take advantage of everything that's there and put it to use. And it's used pretty broadly, as I mentioned, some of the fleets, but also I didn't mention before, but the Department of Defense has had a, a emissions reductions requirement called the EPACT program. So U.S. military bases are also big users of biodiesel for that reason. And whether this continues is really going to be a function of policy. Um, <clears throat> we talked a bit about the health benefits. I think that's been a big bonus for California, which... Uh, particularly, I'm actually in Bakersfield today. It's uh, well known that some of the worst air in the country sits here in the Central Valley between Bakersfield and California. Um, and more stringent emission requirements combined with cleaner burning fuels has made, a, I think, a pretty significant difference to the communities here over the last decade. And uh, But to continue, to continue to grow, we need an RFS and the biodiesel tax credit. Someone, sorry, I thought I heard some, someone trying to ask something. Um, the biggest issue for us, I think, is uh, our industry has struggled in the past when policy sort of becomes a question mark. Um, at times, you know, we as a company couldn't make a decision because we, we didn't have visibility into where the market was going. And, and even when we committed to 
a $45 million project in 2017 to build this new plant, uh, I felt like I was rolling the dice. Uh, I remember meeting with uh, the local congressional representative, representative for where our plant is, and he basically didn't give me much comfort on where this was going to land as far as the future of RFS, the future of, of the biodiesel tax credit. The one thing I could count on was the California program, right? That was in place through 2030. But as it says here, it takes two and a half to four years. Uh, here in California, it takes longer than most places to permit and build a new facility. Um, and then once you build it, you need five to 10 years to get back your invested capital and generate a return. Uh, and that's pretty critical if you want to raise the money uh, to build these kind of facilities and to invest in businesses and infrastructure for things like improved use cooking oil. <clears throat> and the biodiesel tax credit is a big part of that overall economic picture. But when it's when you're not sure if it's coming back or where it's going to be next year, or you're operating for the whole year and it's not in place, um, it's very difficult to try to continue to make investment decisions. Uh, the last few years, RFS has gone through uh, a lot of ups, ups and downs. We're under the Trump administration. Uh, I think our sense is that the small refiner exemptions that Congress put in as part of the RFS regulations, the intent of it was not uh, followed as far as how the Trump administration or the EPA under the Trump administration chose to, to implement those. And you had a lot of uh, a lot of refiners that got exemptions that frankly should have. And then that creates turmoil in the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> right now, we're wondering what happens to RFS after 2022. Uh, RFS in the statute uh, has a mechanism where some things will change after 22, and, and EPA is working on that now. But once again, we're in a place where we're not sure what that's going to look like. Uh, even today, we still don't have the... The RFS mandates a certain volume each year. Um, and right now for 2021, we're almost halfway through it. And the market still doesn't know what exactly is the volume requirement for 2021 for advanced biofuels and for ethanol. And so that creates turmoil in the market and it sends conflicting signals. Um, and as it says here at the bottom, the key is for us as a company, and I think for us as an industry, uh, for folks up and down the biofuels value chain that have now uh, sort of invested and have put their their hat in the, in the ring, um, long-term stable policies is kind of the key uh, when we got to be thinking about investments that take 10 plus years to build and recoup. Um, a closing thought. I don't know, probably some of you won't know about this. Floyd, I don't know if you remember this, but in 2010, there was a, a voter prop here in California to kill the LCFS program and the AB32 carbon reduction program that Governor Schwarzenegger at the time had passed. And it was a program, or the, the proposition was, was funded and initiated by petroleum interests, uh, tens of millions of dollars, I think it was about $70 million was spent from that side uh, to try to get voters uh, at the time during the height of the, the Great Recession to say that we couldn't afford carbon reduction, we didn't need carbon reduction. California voters decided by a pretty significant margin that the answer to that is, yes, we do, and we can't afford it, and we do need it. Um, and I think today, if that prop went up again, uh, I don't think it would do any better and probably I'd be willing to bet that that margin would be the same or even wider than before. We've had another decade where kids here in California are getting to become voters now, and they've grown up with hearing about global warming and growing up with droughts, with the changes in weather, the fires. Um, you know, Clearly, I think amongst voters, this has become a significant issue. And even in 2010 here in California, uh, it was a significant issue. So that's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Harry. Uh, great job uh, outlining uh, 
how important uh, federal policy is to your business, to our industry. Um, with a, with the stable, supportive uh, federal policy, uh, Harry is able to make the investments uh, there in California. That has a great story. He's collecting local uh, feedstocks and uh, producing it locally and using it locally. So without without the federal policies, that wouldn't have been happening. So. Without the federal policies, we wouldn't get the carbon benefits from biodiesel, the health effect, health effect for the health benefits of biodiesel, and of course, the economic benefits. So great job, uh, Harry, and thank you for joining us. And now I'm going to turn it over to Paul Winters, our uh, public affairs uh, director at the National Biodiesel uh, Office in uh, Washington, D.C. Thanks, Tom. And um, I will open the floor to questions if you... I uh, have a question, please just uh, unmute and uh, throw it in there. Uh, while we're doing the questions, I, I've got this tour, uh, the slide up uh, to promote our next uh, in-person tour. It will be in Iowa in August. Uh, it starts out at the Iowa State Fair and uh, we'll tour uh, biodiesel, ethanol, renewable natural gas, several other facilities uh, throughout the uh, Des Moines area. Uh, any interest in attending that, uh, you can let me know or let uh, Monty Shaw at the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association know. And do we have any questions? Hey, I got a question for Floyd if, while we're waiting. Uh, how uh, were you able with the uh, low carbon fuel standard passed just passed in the state of Washington, were you able to use the Trinity study for that to help get that passed, Floyd? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. Great question. Uh, I am happy to report that yes, uh, I, I, you know, from the conversations, and we had multiple conversations with uh, a number of key stakeholders and policymakers. Um, uh, it was clear that you know they were looking for this sort of information uh, to support you know whatever position they were looking for, um, and uh, you know I truly believe that it, it moved the needle in a number of those conversations. Uh, I, I think there was a substantial interest in the public health benefits of the alternative fuels, in particular biodiesel and renewable diesels, since that was a big part of the. Um, the clean fuel standard discussion in Washington. So yeah, uh, I can say that that moved the needle uh, in Washington state. I, I believe it's uh, having a similar effect uh, in conversations we've been having with New York regulators and elsewhere. So um, I, I think this is the sort of information that is you know, something that people really need to understand, not just you know, what are the climate benefits of these programs, but what are the other equally important benefits uh, from a public health standpoint. Thank you, Floyd. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that Harry covered the policy issues uh, far more in depth than I, I can. Um, shows how important these policies are to businesses out there in the country. Um, I will uh, note that uh, even during the uh, pandemic last year when demand for gasoline and, and uh, jet fuel declined, uh, demand for renewable diesel and biodiesel increased slightly, went up about 200 million gallons. Uh, and it shows that uh, as Harry was emphasizing, people really do want these cleaner, better fuels. And uh, that is going to push growth uh, we do have kind of a, um, a lapse of policy at the federal level with, uh, without RFS standards for the year. Uh, but luckily we do have the renewable, uh, the biodiesel tax credit in place through 2022. So um, any final questions? Okay, we've got the uh, slide up to thank our sponsors and I uh, wanna thank everyone for joining. 
Tom, any closing words? Uh, no, just say uh, again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to the speakers and uh, hope, uh, hope you take up Paul's invitation to join uh, the, the tour out in Iowa. Uh, and uh, that will be good. And I think Paul and I are thinking about maybe having a, a, a congressional tour for the Mid-Atlantic area uh, as well uh, later in the year. So if that, that happens, we'll get the information out and hope you can join us for that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.